and caregivers respond appropriately to typical and problematic sexual behaviors in children. Our presenters, Dr. Lisa Swisher and Carrie Pierce, bring a wealth of experience and knowledge on this topic, so we're very lucky to have them here with us today to share their expertise. So without further delay, I will um, let them share a bit about themselves and get started. My name is Lisa Swisher, and I'm a clinical psychologist here at the University of Oklahoma on the Health Sciences Center campus, um, and I have been working um, in some capacity with children with sexual behavior problems for over 13 years now. Uh, another thing that I do is uh, co-direct the adolescent with illegal sexual behavior uh, as well. And so we've done research and have published um, some articles and chapters uh, regarding children with sexual behavior problems. Hi, and I'm Carrie Pierce, and I have had, in some capacity as well, worked with children with sexual behavior problems for, a, for approximately 12 years. Um, and I also work with, um, well, we both work with the preschool children with sexual behavior problems, school age, and with adolescents with illegal sexual behavior. So we um, hope that you, if you have any questions, I think feel free to chat those, or um, and we will try to answer them as we go along. And if we miss those, any of them, we will come back and catch them um, at the very end of the presentation. We also want to let you know that um, the, the PowerPoints will be available to you through Logan um, after the, the presentation is complete. And we will have an additional handout that we'll talk about later that um, we'll ask Logan to email it uh, to you all as well. Right. So the, just so you are aware, um, this information is not just ours. It's uh, and we want to acknowledge Dr. Bonner and several people who have done research in this area along with us and helped us develop the fact sheets that you received earlier, and they also helped us develop this information into um, presentations and trainings that we do. And feel free, what I didn't say, is feel free after the webinar um, on the current slide that you ha that you see, there are, uh, Lisa's email is at the bottom and so is mine, and we are happy to answer any of your questions after the presentation in an email. Just say um, that you heard us on the webinar and that you had a question and we'll be happy to respond to you. And our emails are located on this slide as well. I did want to give you some background information on the National Center on Sexual Behavior of Youth. We were established in 2001 by a grant funded by the Office of Juvenile Justice and Delinquency Prevention, and we were charged with developing and disseminating information and curriculum for adolescents with illegal sexual behavior and children with sexual behavior problems for, multi -discipline, for multiple disciplines and for the public. We do have a website. It's on this slide um, that you are free to go to, and there are publications that you can use and print and disseminate. They are not copy. There's not a copyright. So if you have families or other providers that you would like to share this information with, you can do that. Also be aware that the website is currently under construction and probably will be for the next 16 weeks, potentially. We're um, doing a whole web design overhaul and content overhaul. So. If it looks a little different each time you go to that, I apologize, but we are trying to update it and make it more user-friendly for, for, for professionals and for uh, families also. There will be a family section to that website. Um, the other thing to be aware of is that our information is, a reflection, is not a reflection of the field, but it's meant to improve practice. Um, our presentation is for, um, we designed the presentation, it's geared toward child advocacy professionals and it's an overview of the information about children with sexual behavior problems. So we will define what sexual behavior problems are. Um, we're going to talk about some myths and facts about children, effective treatment, what, what proper supervision looks like, and then appropriate caregiver responses to sexual behavior. And you'll see either SB or SBP several times throughout the slide, and that refers to SBP as sexual behavior problems and SB as sexual, or sexual behaviors. So 
the first thing we want to talk about is terminology. And the term, the proper term to use for these children is children with sexual behavior problems. Um, it's developmentally sensitive because they are children under the age of 12. So we're not adolescents or adults. It focuses on the behavior and not and not giving, not putting a scarlet letter basically on their chest that calls them um, a sex offender. Many programs, particularly with adults, they they refer to adults as adult as adult sex offenders or I'm a sex offender. I'll always be a sex offender. And this is a behavior that manifests itself sexually. We don't want that to be their identity. It's a behavior problem. Um, it also separates the children from uh, delinquent or criminal, criminal acts, which many times adolescents and adults are associated with. And it includes all children with sexual behavior problems um, because those problems manifest itself in many, many different ways. It could be mutual um, sexual behavior problems. It could be in, it could be interpersonal. It could be self-harming sexual behavior problems. There's a huge range of sexual behavior problems. Um, out there that these children exhibit. Um, it could be boundary issues. It runs the gamut. One thing I we hear a lot, and, and I don't know if you hear this, but I hear a lot that children are perpetrators or they're perping on their sister or many perps, uh, young pedophiles, molesters, perverts. Those are all inappropriate terms when talking about um, children, these children and their sexual behavior problems. Those are... Um, those are definitely terms that should be saved and used for adults. Um, but, and I always think when I hear mini perps, I sometimes I'll get police officers, they'll say they're just a mini perp. And I'm like, is that a serial that they're talking about? So I always think that's a funny one. But it also has a lot of um, ramifications. You don't want the child to grow up thinking, I'm a sex offender or I'm a perpetrator. Again, it's just a behavior. Um, and it's not. The other thing is it's not always sexual reactive, sexually reactive, and we'll talk about that a little bit later, but it implies that they've been sexually abused and therefore they're just reciprocating that behavior, and that's not always accurate. Um, and again, we'll get into this later, but not all children who have sexual behavior problems have been sexually abused. So sexually reactive is also not an appropriate term um, to use with these kids. So always have that proper terminology. Um, typical sexual behavior, these are behaviors that involve the body parts that are considered private or sexual. So these would be the genitals, breasts, buttocks, um, and they're normally part of growing up for many children, um, and they wouldn't, cons and many um, professionals wouldn't consider this to be harmful. So for instance, a lot of, uh, we all develop sexually as we develop in other ways. Um, you know, when you're an adolescent and even pre-adolescent, you are developing, your body is changing. Well, you're also discovering and developing as you're a young child. You're learning about um, going to the bathroom and what your body part functions are. You're learning about, um, you know, why you wear your clothes, why you don't wear your clothes. Little kids that are two and three, they don't want their clothes on they because they're itchy and they're confining. They just want to take their shirt off and run around in the mud puddles without their clothes on. So typical sexual behaviors are um, normal development, development that these kids have, such as playing doctor, I'll show you yours if you're showing me mine. They're really curious about differences, what other people look like, what the body functions are for, um, and they're generally mutually agreed upon behaviors. So there's not any aggression or coercion. There now one kid may say, Hey, I want to see what your pee pee looks like, but that's not necessarily aggressive. It's just the curiosity. Um, and so it's just normal curiosity. There's not any fear, there's not any anger, there's not any um difference in significant ages or development levels. Um, and, and also be aware of culture and social factors. I, in many cultures, sleeping and bathing together is acceptable, and it may influence their sexual behavior. It may be um, quite normal for a culture for older kids to take baths together. Maybe it's conserving energy. Maybe that's just how they um, are in their home. And so being aware of what those cultural factors are when you're working with families is very important. For instance, in the Netherlands, there's a greater frequency 
of normative, um, kind of non-problematic sexual behaviors of being nude in front of each other. It's more normal for older kids to be nude in front of each other, whereas here in the U.S., that might be seen as having a sexual behavior problem. So just being aware of what normal, um, what is normal in that culture. Many times, um, along with that sexual behavior, we call it sexual play. It's often exploratory, like we said. Um, it, they may be playing house, they may be playing doctor. I'll show you yours if you show me mine. They're curious, they wanna see what's going on with each other and differences and similarities. It's often spontaneous, um, so it just happens. It's not planned. Many of these children don't have the mental capacity to plan these uh, sexual, uh, sexual play. It just happens when they're playing. It's intermittent, so it doesn't happen all the time or frequently. Both kids agree to it, even though one may suggest it. Both kids typically agree. Uh, the children are similar in age, size, and development level. And something to consider here, sometimes I see kids or we see kids that develop mentally um, or functionally, they may be functioning at a lower level, so they may be nine, but all their friends are six because that's where they are and they're functioning. And they may be a smaller nine-year-old. And so for them, it's normal to be at a developmental level of a six-year-old. So it's real important to also assess their developmental level um, when you're talking about this. And also there's not any anger, fear, strong anxiety like we mentioned. Both of the kids are, are kind of embarrassed that they got, or the children are embarrassed that they got caught or upset that they might um, got in, get in trouble, but there's, they're not really mad at each other. They're, they're more embarrassed when an adult finds out. So that's how you kind of tell sexual play. Um, it occurs across childhood. It's not only in preschool children. I talked briefly about, you know, little preschool kids like to take off their clothes and run around and get in the mud puddles without their clothes on. It happens all across childhood, so all the way up through 12. Um, that's one of the things that you need to be aware of. As they develop into the more school age, the school age uh, ages, it does become a little more concealed or a little more covert. They become more embarrassed. They become aware of their bodies. They don't like to change clothes in front of adults. Um, they, you know, a, a mom may say, well, gosh, I always used to help her with her shower. I always used to walk into her room, and now she yells at me when I walk into her room and she doesn't have clothes on. Or she says, mom, quit, I'm embarrassed. Those are normal development. They're starting to develop their bodies. They're starting to become aware that they need to dress um, in private when they don't have their clothes on. All that's normal development. But as they're also talking to their friends more, their friends may be talking about sex, their friends may be talking about development, and that may become more, um, I don't want to use the word secretive, that sounds ugly, but it becomes more, not as out in the open with their parents because they're, and there may be giggling when they're talking about it, um, that sort of thing. So it's still development all the way across. Um, and it usually occurs with children that are known already. So friends, still siblings, it may with, be with kids of the same sex. That doesn't mean that they, um, are gay, it just means that that's who's available, they know them, they feel comfortable with them. Remember we talked about it's spontaneous, it's intermittent, um, it, there's not any fear or anger, so maybe they're just talking about it. So it may be same sex. Um, oftentimes parents will come, um, I find it more in boys than girls, that the parents will say, well, are they gay? Because he, you know, he's interested in looking at another little boy or he touched another little boy. That doesn't mean anything. It just means that it was a spontaneous thought and they acted on that thought with who was available or who they knew and felt comfortable with. Oh, I'm sorry, I went too far. There we go. Um, occasionally, we will get phone calls um, from caregivers who are concerned about um, their child's what appears to be just typical sexual behavior. So those kinds of things that Carrie was talking about, um, kids playing doctor together. So say two six-year-olds playing doctor together and they've removed their clothes um, and maybe we're touching each other's private parts. 
um, and has occurred maybe on one occasion. Um, and parents are concerned maybe that this means that their child has a sexual behavior problem. Um, but in cases like that where it, it appears to be that it's, and we'll talk in a minute about how you know when something is a sexual behavior problem, um, but in cases where it appears that it's just that typical sexual play that occurs across development, um, it, it do, that doesn't mean that the parents should ignore the behavior, that school teachers should ignore the behavior. Um, there does need to be some type of discussion uh, with the child about the behavior. And so here are some ideas about what a caregiver or a teacher could do um, when they discover um, that their child has engaged in a sexual behavior. Um, and certainly um, the parent or the, the caregiver wouldn't want to do all of these things, but they'd want to kind of assess the situation and see um, which one of these methods or which type of discussion would be most appropriate to the situation. Um, so for example, um, one of our colleagues here uh, had a daughter who um, was, I think, about four, and she and her little friend, uh, who was also four, were playing dress up. Um, and so they were back in the bedroom and they were putting on princess costumes. Um, and so they were taking off their clothes to um, put on the new princess dress. And so when they were doing that, then they started laughing and giggling and pointing at each other's private parts while the mom overheard what was going on and went in and saw what was happening. And so she very calmly separated the kids and instructed them, you know, it's not okay to show your private parts um, to other people. Um, and it's, you know, not okay to show your private parts to friends, but I know you guys want to play dress up, so here's some leotards. You guys change the leotard, you know, put the leotards on separately, um, and then you can just put the dress on over the leotard. So she didn't go into a lengthy discussion, um, but she gave very clear rules about this is what's not okay. It's not okay to show your private parts to other kids. Um, or other people, and here's the rule about playing dress up from now on. Um, and so, you know, again, depending on the situation, you might um, handle it differently. You might advise a parent to handle it differently. differently. So, for example, say um, a little girl was interested in her younger brother um, and how he was going to the bathroom. So say it's a five-year-old girl and she starts wanting to observe her little brother go to the bathroom. I mean, that's pretty fascinating. He does that differently than she does. And so the parent might want to pull the little girl out and say, explain, you know, boys' private parts are different than the girls' private parts and this is how boys used to the bathroom, this is how girls use the bathroom, um, but it's not okay to watch other people go to the bathroom. Um, so again, just very brief rules about what's okay and what's not okay. Now we're going to switch um, in a bit here and talk more about sexual behavior problems. And so how do we know when that typical sexual behavior has crossed the line um, and it's a problematic sexual behavior? Um, here is a definition that was created um, by our colleagues uh, James Slavsky and Barbara Bonner. Um, and sexual behavior problems are uh, defined as children or child-initiated behaviors that involve, pri involve private part body parts, um, so genitals, breasts, buttocks, um, in a manner that is either developmentally inappropriate, um, and that can include things, acts that aren't typically known to children, so for example, um, children French kissing each other or tongue kissing each other, most um, you know, six, seven-year-olds do not know about that kind of kissing. So that would be something that would be really inappropriate for them to be engaging in. Um, any act that is either potentially harmful to themselves, um, so uh, a child touching themselves so much, and um, we use the term self-touch here um, in Oklahoma and not the word masturbation. Um, we're a pretty conservative state and parents uh, get a little concerned when we start talking about children masturbating. Uh, so I don't know if Washington is uh, conservative as well, but we are here, so we use self-touch. Um, but any time that a child is self-touching so much that it's causing sores or infections, that's a, that's a behavior problem that needs to be addressed uh, with a professional. Uh, another point, too, about self-touch is that it can Sometimes it can certainly be physically harmful to them, but it can also be socially harmful to them. Um, we had a child who was self-touching so much that she couldn't participate in ballet class. She was doing it in ballet class, she was doing it at school, 
um, kids start to notice that when you're, you know, in the second grade and know that most people don't touch themselves like that. And so she was being shunned socially. Um, so not only was she causing some physical harm to herself, but she was causing some social harm um, in her development as well. And certainly sexual behavior problems um, can also be harmful um, either emotionally to other kids or physically to other kids depending on the, the behavior that occurs. Uh, and we just want to make it clear when we're talking about children with sexual behavior problems, uh, we're referring to both boys and girls that are 12 years of age and younger. Um, information about kids um, with sexual behavior problems changes as when they're adolescents, and so that would be a whole um, different uh, presentation that we would provide if we were talking about adolescents. And I think Carrie mentioned this earlier, that although we use the term sexual behavior problems, um, many times the intention or the motivation for these behaviors um, may not be related at all to sexual gratification. Um, there appears to be a wide range of um, motivations uh, for these behaviors. Um, for example, these may include um, curiosity, so ch children just are curious um, about private parts or body parts um, and take it a bit too far um, or continue to do that behavior even after a caregiver has come in and a, provided appropriate education or redirection, um, but they continue to engage in that behavior. Um, so certainly um, curiosity could be a factor. Um, another factor that we see um, is anxiety um, or kind of a self-soothing. Um, so sometimes kids have um, don't have appropriate coping skills. And so one way maybe that they have learned um, to soothe themselves are to, to self-touch. They find that it produces a pleasurable sensation, it can be calming, um, and it may be something that they use um, when they get anxious to self-soothe themselves. Um, it could also be related to imitation. Um, so kids maybe have seen uh, movies or adults or older babysitters stay in the house engaging in sexual behavior um, and you know part of the typical play for kids is to imitate what adults are doing and so their sexual behavior may just be um, imitating what they've seen. Um, it could also be related to attention seeking. Um, say that they have um, a an involved parent, um, a parent who's not very um, nurturing um, or don't have a strong relationship with the child, um, but the child discovers, okay, I can get a big reaction out of mom um, whenever I start to touch my private parts or whenever I touch my little brother's private parts. That's how I can get her attention. Um, and so it can uh, be something like that. Um, but there are lots of lots of reasons um, that children may engage in sexual behavior. Um, and it's also important to note that this is just a definition of sexual behavior. There's no uh, diagnosis of problematic sexual behavior in children. So now we're going to talk um, about how do you distinguish what is that typical sexual play that Carrie spoke about at the beginning versus what is um, problematic sexual behavior. Um, so we have some guidelines that have been ba based um, from just clinical experience, from um, research, and a normative sample that I'll talk about here in a minute. Um, but one way that we can tell whether or not a child is engaging in problematic sexual behavior is any time that they're engaging in those intrusive, unusual sexual behaviors. So for example, acts that, like I talked about earlier, that would not normally be known to a children, like tongue kissing, oral sex. Um, most eight-year-olds would not know about oral sex, and that's certainly a problem. Um, even if both parties were eight years old, but they agreed to engage in the, the oral sex, certainly that would be something that would require an intervention. Um, I'll talk in a couple of slides um, about some other rare sexual behaviors. Anytime that um, the child um, continues to engage in a sexual behavior at a great, greater frequency or duration um, than what is typical um, would be cause for concern. So for example, it's not unusual, say, for two preschool age children to be playing children, two, two, school, two preschool age children to be playing doctor together. Um, but it would be a bit more unusual, say, for a nine-year-old 
to keep playing doctor um, and keep trying to look at other people's private parts. That, that begins to be um, more unusual and, and not um, something that you would expect of a typical nine-year-old. This is fairly rare, but anytime there's coercion or aggression involved, um, that is certainly um, would uh, be uh, recommended that they have treatment. Um, so um, coercion would be something like um, telling the other child, hey, if you um, touch my private parts, I will buy you a candy bar, or if you don't um, touch my private parts, I'm going to tell your mom that you stole the gum from the store or something like that. Um, aggression is even rarer than coercion in children with sexual behavior problems, but certainly there have been cases um, where the child has held the other child down um, to complete the sexual act, um, or um, in another case that we had where the uh, little girl who was engaging in the sexual behavior problem would not let her sister out of the room um, and like uh, tied the door so that the babysitter couldn't open the door um, coming into the room. And that is certainly, like I said, very unusual, but also highly problematic and definitely in need of treatment. Any time um, that the sexual behavior is either potentially harmful to the child engaging in the sexual behavior, like self-touch, or that it's harming other kids, um, that would certainly be um, a guideline that it would be a problematic sexual behavior. I spoke a little bit about this earlier when I was talking about the little girl who um, was uh, using self-touch so, or doing self-touch so much that other kids started to become aware of that. She couldn't participate in ballet class. But any time that the child is engaging in sexual behavior so much that it's excluding them from being able to be a part of normal childhood activities um, would certainly be problematic. So any time that, you know, child can't have a play date because every time they're with a child, they're going to engage in a sexual act, um, certainly that's a problem. Uh, if the sexual behavior does not decrease with those typically effective parenting strategies that we talked about earlier about what can you do or what a parent should do, provide some education, separate the children, if necessary, give a brief, brief consequence um, for the behavior, um, but the behavior continues, that would certainly let us know that it's a problematic sexual behavior. Uh, the next one is that Carrie spoke about this earlier when um, the children are signif significantly different in age. So, for example, um, a 12-year-old um, asking to engage in a sexual act um, with an 8-year-old or a 6-year-old would be problematic. Um, usually that typical sexual behavior um, occurs among kids kids that are about the same age. Um, and then, or if they have di different developmental abilities. So it's say two eight-year-olds, um, but one of the eight-year-olds functions like a four-year-old, um, that, that would be um, considered problematic sexual behavior. And again, any time that there's fear or anxiety or a strong negative emotion um, that's accompanied with the sexual behavior um, by either party that's involved um, would certainly be um, cause for, for treatment or intervention. Uh, now I want to talk just a little bit about the normative sample um, of typical sexual behaviors. So earlier we referred to um, Dr. Friedrich's research um, in his instrument that he developed called the CSBI or the Children's Sexual Behavior Inventory. Um, and when he created that m measurement, um, which is can be administered by clinicians um, and it's given to caregivers of children between the ages of 2 and 12 um, so that they can, uh, and it just lists about 38 sexual behaviors that the parents can rate um, whether or not their child engages in that never up to um, weekly. Um, that, that's, I'm just d describing the measure. That's what the measure looks like. But when he created the measure, um, he, he had a normative sample. So he just took um, a typical sample of kids um, who were not referred for sexual behavior to find out what, what do kids typically do, what, what does their sexual behavior look like. Um, and so what he found was that these top four um, on the PowerPoint, um, no parent reported that their child engaged in that sexual behavior. Those are rated as never occurring. So certainly any time 
um, a child engages in one of those top four behaviors would certainly be um, considered a problematic sexual behavior. And then the lower four parents um, reported that their children rarely engaged in those types of sexual behavior. Um, so those were seen as rare, um, and certainly those would be cause for um, at least an, an assessment to see uh, if treatment was warranted. I just want to talk about um, research and what we know about children with sexual behavior problems. Um, there's been a little bit of research done, um, not only at our center, but at some other places across the, the nation regarding children with sexual behavior problems. Um, and so from that, we've kind of developed a list of uh, common characteristics that we see in kids with sexual behavior problems. Um, one, of course, is that they do have sexual behavior problems. Um, but like Carrie mentioned, those can be anywhere from, and they're on a, a range um, from problematic self-touch um, all the way up to vaginal or anal penetration. So there are a range of sexual behavior problems um, that occur with children um, under the age of 12. Uh, the more severe the sexual behavior problems are, uh, including the intensity of the sexual behavior, the frequency of it, uh, or the actual act itself, the more likely the child is to have um, other behavior problems. So being defiant um, with authority figures, um, being oppositional, argumentative, um, those are certainly characteristics that we see in many of the children that we treat, certainly not all of them, but many of the children that, that um, have sexual behavior problems. Um, another common characteristic would be uh, internalizing symptoms. So these are um, symptoms like of depression or anxiety. Um, it may also include some trauma react reactions. Um, so kids who may have been sexually abused or physically abused, um, they may be having some trauma reactions related to that. Um, nightmares in preschool children, we see um, a lot of separation anxiety. Um, in, our, in our preschool population. Um, so it's not uncommon for kids with sexual behavior problems to have limited coping skills. Um, so they don't know of uh, good ways to cope in general. Um, and so they have a lot of impulse problems. Uh, they do a lot of things, including sexual behavior, without thinking. Um, but these are also the kids maybe that uh, interrupt the teacher, um, will cut in line, uh, will just do a lot of impulsive things um, without thinking, thinking it through. Uh, for all of our kids, before um, we determine treatment recommendations for them, we have an assessment um, where we meet um, with the parent um, and sometimes the child to determine uh, to, to do an assessment to determine treatment recommendations. But a common thing that we see um, for kids with sexual behavior problems is learning disabilities. Um, and, and so uh, kids may not be able, you know, may have an expressive learning disability, may not be able to express themselves, um, may be falling behind in school because of their learning disability. Um, so that's, that's another common problem. Another one is social problems. So some of these kids may not know how to interact appropriately with kids their own age. You may see them um, being, being more likely to play with younger children or much older children. They just don't seem to appear to know how to interact with kids their own age. Or they may be kind of the bullies or the one being bullied. Um, and so we see those problems um, with kids with sexual behavior problems. The parent-child relationship um, is often a concern uh, as well with kids. Not, and again, this is for some of the kids, not all of the kids. Um, but for some of the kids, there's a, a lack of consistency um, with the relationship. So maybe the parent is in and out of the home. The child has been in and out of foster care, um, back and forth um, among you know caregivers from grandparent to a step-parent um, to a biological parent. Um, and so that um, seems to, to be related to kids with sexual behavior problems. Um, sometimes 
uh, parents of kids with sexual behavior problems um, have very strong beliefs about their child, and we'll talk about that in a minute, but they may believe that their child is, because of, they've engaged in the sexual behavior, they may believe, believe their child is evil, is bad, um, is destined to be a sex offender, um, and so that's some of the uh, work that we'll do is working with the parent about having accurate beliefs about the child. Um, and if needed, also working with them to improve their relationship uh, with the child. The home and community environment um, can certainly be a factor in kids with sexual behavior problems. Um, it's not uncommon for these kids to come from um, backgrounds that are just highly sexualized. Um, there's not a lot of um, supervision in the home. So maybe um, kids are able to watch R-rated movies, access um, pornographic websites, um, or maybe even watching, you know, those kinds of movies with their parent. Um, and there's just tends to be poor boundaries in the home. Nobody really shuts the door. It's not uncommon for kids and parents to walk around naked for each other or to observe sexual activity of adults in the home. Um, so, you know, that's certainly a factor in this. Um, occasionally, we'll see more severe co-occurring um, diagnoses or issues or conditions in these kids. Um, so I talked a little bit earlier to tie the bedroom door shut so the babysitter couldn't come in. I mean, that she had planned that act. That is very, very rare. We, we do not see that very often. Um, but it's certainly, um, you know, a cause for some additional treatment and maybe some additional um, supports being placed in the home to make sure that, that kids and, and uh, families can stay safe. Um, occasionally we will see um, children uh, with post-traumatic stress disorder, um, either, like I said, relating from their own sexual abuse or physical abuse or something that they've been involved in, like a tornado or something like that. Um, and they may have some significant re-experiencing symptoms of that event. Um, we also see kids um, who have oppositional defiant disorder, um, so they're just making poor choices across the board and are pretty defiant with their parents. Rarely um, we see kids who have conduct disorder or are delinquent um, and involved in more rule-breaking, law-breaking type behavior. And certainly um, we do see kids that have uh, more of significant uh, parent relationship problems um, or attachment difficulties. Um, so that may be something that needs to be addressed in treatment as well. So I just want to give a summary of um, children with sexual behavior problems and, and the characteristics. Um, like I've mentioned earlier, there are diverse types of sexual behavior problems. There's not one profile that's going to fit these children. Um, they are diverse in terms of race, so this occurs, occurs across all races. Um, gender, um, in the preschool group, about two-thirds of the children that we treat are females, so it tends to be more prevalent, um, and sexual behavior problems tend to be more prevalent um, in preschool-aged females. Um, and that's a bit flipped with school-age children. With school-age children, it's about two-thirds males um, and one-third female. Um, they're diverse in terms of their family factors. Some um, kids that we see live um, with high-functioning uh, parents and they're, you know, with their biological parents who are still married um, and, like I said, appear to be high-functioning, um, all the way to, like I said, kids that have been bounced um, around in many different foster foster homes. They're diverse in terms of their SES, so we have from the poorest of the poor to pretty um, wealthy families who are actually able to fly in for their treatment um, from another state. So um, very diverse in terms of SES, um, diverse in terms of their maltreatment histories. Um, many of the kids that we treat appear to have no um, child abuse uh, or neglect history at all. Um, and certainly diverse in terms of their comorbid problems. Many that we see um, are quite functioning quite well um, and appear to have good coping and good support um, all the way up to those more severe conduct disordered kids that we may see. Um, so I just you know, want to make the point that children with sexual behavior problems appear to be a more diverse group than adult or adolescent uh, sexual offenders. 
um, particularly in regards to gender. What we know about adolescents and adults is that they're typically male. Um, but for children, um, it's not uncommon um, and sometimes very common to see females in treatment. So there's no profile, there's no way that you can tell who is going to be a child with sexual behavior problems. Um, what we have found out through our research here is that um, preschool children appear to have more um, frequent sexual behavior problems. Um, so they, you know, or if they have a problem uh, with boundary issues, they may be hugging strangers that they don't know well, and that happens um, many, many times a day. Um, whereas school-aged kids, they may have a sexual behavior problem, but once it gets discovered, um, it, it really does not occur very frequently again. Um, also, kids, uh, preschool children with sexual behavior problems tend to have more significant comorbid problems. That's especially in regards to um, separation anxiety. There's more internalizing factors that I spoke about, um, PTSD, as well as some more externalizing problems, the conduct, or not conduct disorders, but um, ADHD-like symptoms and things like that. Okay, I'm going to talk a little bit about the effects of having a, um, sexual behavior problems on the children and the family. And the family. So the effects on the child, the other children, and the fa and then and then the family as a whole. One thing I think that it's important to remember is, um, and it's easy to forget sometimes when you see a lot of these kids is every parent feels very isolated and very extreme, their stress levels are definitely very high when they're dealing with these kids. It's something that, because when you use the word sex and children together, it's very, at least in our state, um, it's kind of a shameful thing. It's not something that we talk about in the open. If your child has ADHD, you know, you can tell your neighbor, you can tell your sister, you can tell your child's teacher at school, you know, he's got ADHD, he's gonna do these things. Um, I just wanted to let you know, if he does this, call me, or it's a result of this. It's not typically something you go to your Sunday school class or your best friend or your neighbor and say, oh, Johnny has sexual behavior problems, so he might do this. And But, you know, just do this, and it'll all be fine. So um, it is very stressful, and sometimes the parents are feeling very guilty, I think, or angry. Um, or sad about the behavior their children is having. And they and it is just a behavior problem, but it's one that it's harder to talk about, and you definitely don't share with a lot of people, so they're often isolated. So there is a risk, or not necessarily a risk, but there could be co-occurring behavior or emotional problems in the family with the child or with the other children in the family. Um, you know, you spend a lot of time with a child that has sexual behavior problems. You spend a lot of time making sure they're supervised, and other children in the home may see it as um, you're giving them special attention when really you're supervising them. So there may be um, the other children in the home may act out trying to get the parent's attention. Um, there's also, if there are children in the home, other children in the home, there's an increased risk of victimization. You definitely have to provide the proper supervision um, if there are younger kids in the home or other kids of similar age because you don't want them to be victimized. And so there is an increased risk that there is victimization, even though most of the time with proper treatment these children um, won't go on to reoffend. You still have to put in place the proper protection. Um, also, on the flip side of that, there's an increased risk of victimization to other kids, but because the child has sexual behavior problems and has a misrepresentation of how they should react sexually, there's also the risk that the child with the sexual behavior problems is also at an increased risk to become the victim themselves. And so I think it's important to remember both sides. Yes, younger children may be at increased risk, but the child themselves may also be, because their perceptions of what is appropriate are skewed or, or not correct, and they become they then then become the risk for increased victimization by others. And so you have to remember that their boundaries are poor and they don't always know how to say no or they don't always know when to tell somebody that something may be going on. So or they may put themselves in a position that puts them at risk because they don't always know not to. So there's it goes both ways and, and just remember it's protection for both sides of that coin. Um, and we just talked about briefly that there increased caregiver stress. Um, 
they always have to supervise their kid or their kid always needs to be supervised. Um, younger kids in the home always need to be supervised. How do I supervise? I have three kids under the age of eight. How do I supervise all these kids? What are way, how do I give them a bath? How do I cook supper? How do I do laundry? How do I do all these things? And I'm supposed to be keeping my eyes on, supervision is eyes on. How am I supposed to work this in my house? Um, I, they want to go outside and play and they want to shoot baskets. How do I do this? Do I need to be out there with them all the time? How does that work? Um, I think there's also an increased risk for placement disruptions because it's either the younger kids or the other kids in the home may be um, placed somewhere else or the child with sexual behavior problems may be placed somewhere else due to the nature of their behavior problems. Not all workers that work with this families are educated or understand that most kids can remain in the home with proper supervision and caretaker involvement, but some kids can't. And so what do you do about that? Where are they going to live? I don't want them to go inpatient, but I have nobody around that they can go stay with. Where are they going to live at? Um, this also can cause poor social problems or poor peer relationships. Uh, Dr. Swisher talked about briefly earlier about how that manifests itself um, when they're doing actions, but it also, they can't go on traditional sleepovers because they need to be supervised. They can't, um, if they're involved in other activities, do you have to go with them and make sure they're supervised? Other kids in the home maybe can't have friends over at night because you have a child with sexual behavior problems. So it may hinder their um, peer relations because of the limitations you have to put on the supervision. And this can also affect the other children in the home. Um, and then, as Lisa talked about earlier, it, it's for their maybe they're acting out at school or maybe they're acting out in ballet class. And other kids notice when kids are not acting appropriately. Maybe they're acting out in school in the bathroom and the other kids are like, oh, we can't go to the bathroom with him. So um, there are ways that it affects their social and peer relationships as well. Um, Again, we're going to talk just briefly about the other children in the home. There's very, very limited research on how the sexual behavior problems have a, a, the effects on the other children in the home. Um, a lot of it may depend on the coercion and aggression, the level of coercion and aggression. Um, it depends on the age differences, the severity and frequency. If it happened one time and it was fondling, maybe there won't be any effects on the other children, but if it was actual full intercourse and it happened, you know, 13 times in a month, that's going to be pretty severe. They, uh, other children may definitely have different um, behavior problems as a result of that. Any uh, premorbid functioning and the support from the caregivers. I think, again, this is a really tough line for caregivers to walk because they love all the children and how do I support the child who may have been victimized and how do I also support the, pro the child that has the sexual behavior problems. And I think that's a really fine line to walk. And it's a hard one for parents, and they're very frustrated and stressed about it. Um, also, other effects, and again, remember the research here is limited, but there's confusion about appropriate peer interactions. So somebody has um, sexually abused them, and now they're not sure, well, what's appropriate behavior for me? What can I can't, what I, what can I do and what I can't, what can't I do, um, and that may also put them at risk for victimization because they're, now their level of understanding is skewed. They may also develop sexual behavior problems themselves, although this, again, most kids who have been sexually abused do not have sexual behavior problems, but it is a possibility. Um, there may be anxiety, depression symptoms, PTSD symptoms. They may also, we talked about peer problems, they may have peer problems because they can't have friends over um, anymore because they have a big brother or a sister who has sexual behavior problems. Maybe they're, maybe they're highly anxious or um, maybe they're more aggressive because they're still dealing with symptoms that, uh, as a result of their victimization. So maybe that causes them to have disruptive behaviors in school or with their friends and act out, um, not sexually, but just in other ways. And so it may cause peer problems within their own peers. So I think it's really important to remember that it does affect, it can affect other children, but the research is so limited at this point, we're not sure um, of all the effects and the percentages that go with that. Um, I think we have a poll question next. 
and so it's kind of it's a true false or you don't know which is fine to say but the question is all children with sexual behavior problems have been sexually abused so answer true false or I don't know Still getting answers. Still going. <laughs> Sorry. Okay, it looks like we've come to a stopping point, so we're going to show the results. So most people answered false. That means you're listening to us. That's great. <laughs> and that is correct. All children with sexual behavior problems have been sexually abused. That is false. So, um, and we're going to, the next slide, we'll talk a little bit about that. We, um, you know, the, often the myth is, well, if they're having sexual behavior problems, that means they've been sexually abused. Or, um, so they have to have been sexually abused. And in the 80s, the early 80s, this became a big problem because, Everybody believed if a child was having sexual behavior problems, then they um, have been abused, and they were getting children were getting sent to forensic interviews, and for and getting sent to places saying who abused you, who abused you, you had to have been sexually abused, or you wouldn't, um, or you wouldn't have these problems. How do you know about these problems? And the, and so in the early 80s, it became a, a big problem for um, that this myth was. Perpetuated. So that research does show that most kids have not been sexually abused, um, and that's really important. So just because a kid's acting out, don't go looking for an abuser as well. Um, I will say that kids who have been sexually abused, they have been found to exhibit more frequent and intrusive sexual behaviors than other children without a history. So if they have been sexually abused, their sexual behavior problems may be more frequent or intrusive than those who have not, but most kids have not been sexually abused. Going for another question. So most children with sexual behavior problems do not demonstrate continued sexual behavior problems into adolescence and adulthood. Okay, it looks like we're ready to show the results. Correct. For those of you who answered true, um, most children with sexual behavior problems do not demonstrate continued sexual behavior problems into adolescence and adulthood. Um, so they, uh, but Lisa, I think it was Lisa that briefly, um, that briefly talked about this. Most of our preschool children with sexual behavior problems are female, probably about 90% of them are female, and most of our adult sex offenders are male. And so they don't, most um, sex offenders I know were not four or five-year-old little girls at one point and then had a change, of a sex change, and now are adult males in prison. So um, most of the time they do not grow up to be adolescents. Another question here? So the question is, doesn't it depend on if the issue is addressed? Uh, yes. I mean, I, I, again, the research doesn't indicate strongly one way or the other. Unfortunately, this is an area where the research is not really strong. But with proper intervention and supervision, most kids do not go on to reoffend. Um, there is some research on, um, it's, again, it's very limited, 
that kids did not have proper intervention, but they and later they were found out to have had an illegal sexual behavior as an adolescent, but then did not go on to reoffend. Um, this was adolescent research, not children. So again, that's a difference. But yes, um, mostly you want to recommend an intervention and proper supervision. But the research isn't clear. If it has to be. If it has to be. Um, there has been some retroactive studies that have stated for adolescents that they were adult men and they went back and said, did you ever have illegal sexual behavior? And some of them answered yes. Even though they didn't have treatment, they didn't reoffend sexually again. Self-report, retroactive, but that's what we have research-wise. Um, we have a next question. With appropriate treatment and careful supervision, most children with sexual behavior problems can live safely with other children. Okay. Wow. That was wow. Okay. You guys did really well there, 100%. I think that is um, brilliant that we got 100%. Most kids can, most children with sexual behavior problems can um, live in the home with children, uh, live safely in the home with other children. Um, there are the, the few, there is a few, a little, very small percentage of children that have highly aggressive or intrusive sexual behaviors that regardless of treatment and regardless of intervention and supervision, they continue to have sexual behavior problems. And if those, um, if they continue to have sexual behavior problems, even with intervention and supervision, those kids cannot safely remain in the home. But those are the small percentage. Um, also, depending on the effects on the other children, I think that those need to be considered. Are the other children comfortable with the children with sexual behavior problems to live in the home with them? Um, are they, and by comfortable, you know, they may still be concerned, but are they feeling safe with the parent supervision or are they having symptoms? Then we may need to consider a short-term um, play, alternative placement. Was there a question? Yeah, there's a question about if there's going to be a portion of the presentation that addresses how to work with children who have sexual behavior problems. And we do provide trainings um, on treatment um, for children with sexual behavior problems, but those trainings um, are about a week long and then involve a year's worth of consultation um, in the form of uh, phone calls and um, us being able to observe videotapes. But we will talk a bit about what to look for when recommending treatment. Um, for children um, who have problematic sexual behavior problems, as well as um, uh, some supervision guidelines you can recommend for parents. Um, and then there's another question. Since most sexual be children with sexual behavior problems are female, and that's most children with sexual behavior problems are actually split between male and female. It's just with preschool children, there tends to be more um, females that engage in problematic sexual behavior than school-age children where that's flip-flopped. Um, but the question is, and since there's not much research on this area, do we know what the percentage of male children with sexual behavior problems continue to have sexual behavior problems? So um, we've done some treatment outcome research here. Um, in both male and female children who have had sexual behavior problems and participated uh, in treatment. Um, we followed them up 10 years um, after they had completed uh, treatment and uh, a very small percentage, it was I think 2%, um, had gone on to have sexual behavior problems. So the majority um, of children, both male and female, do not, with treatment, do not go on to have continued sexual behavior problems. Actually, as part of that treatment study also, we compared just a general uh, ADHD clinic that was also going on at the same time, and their percentage for reoffending sexually, um, the ADHD clinic compared to our children with sexual behavior was this, about the same. So. 
We're going to ask another question now. Most children with sexual behavior problems cannot attend safely. True, false, or I don't know. Sorry, we have an ambulance going by our window. Waiting on the results still. Okay, we're good. Oh, I hope we're still there. Um, Logan. Yes, I think you're you're good. Okay, okay sorry. Um, it, most children with sexual behavior problems cannot attend school safely. That is false. So 93% got it right. Most kids. Uh, can attend school safely um, with other kids without jeopardizing the safety of other students. You do want these kids involved in pro-social activities. Um, you want them involved in normal activities. You want them involved with pro-social peers. So most can attend and participate in school activities. Um, there are those few children, again, that have serious aggressive sexual behaviors and they haven't responded to outpatient treatment that may need a more restrictive educational um, environment, and or there might be kids that are their sexual behaviors are happening at school, and so those kids definitely may need to have more um, increased supervision or more intensive um, or restrictive educational environment. A question we always get from parents um, and from other providers are, do the school personnel need to know? And um, I think that most of the time you can say no, the school personnel don't need to know, uh, particularly if the behavior problems aren't happening at school, um, if, if the, um, and depending on what the sexual behavior problems are. If they are happening at school, you can work with the school on alternative um, kind of supervision. They only go to the bathroom by themselves. Maybe they go to the bathroom in a staff lounge instead of a student bathroom. Um, they need not to be supervised. So, I, I again, that's dependent, but most of the time school personnel don't need to know. I think we have a lot of questions all of a sudden. Okay. Um, one question is what are the – statistics on those children who do not go into treatment. Um, and unfortunately, that research um, is not available or has not been conducted as far as um, we are aware. We just have the research on kids who have presented uh, for treatment. Correct. Um, then another question was, if children with sexual behavior problems are removed from the home, where do they end up? Um, typically, they end up either in a kinship foster placement um, or in uh, just DHS or uh, child welfare may not be involved and they just end up living with another relative um, for the time being until uh, treatment can occur, until uh, everybody feels safe with the child being uh, placed back in the home. Or it may be a, just a typical foster care. Um, in very few cases, they may be um, sent to a residential or an inpatient treatment, and we'll talk about that a bit in a minute. Um, there is another question about what would we advise to someone who is dealing with a parent who treats their child as a sex offender, the child was sexually abused, so I'm assuming that the child is not having sexual behavior problems, however this parent will not allow the child around other children at all. Um, so I guess, I mean, a couple of things I would recommend is that you could provide some of the fact sheets to um, the caregiver, um, the NC, there's some on the ncsby.org and then some on the nctsn.net. They have some really good fact sheets. If education hasn't worked, I may refer the family for treatment um, so that the treatment provider can help, um, you know, dealing with those issues. Um, it may be that the parent is just having a very strong reaction um, to the child's sexual abuse. Um, and so they may need to have some treatment 
uh, to be able to, to move forward. Um, and then the other question was, at what point would you have to make a, a child welfare report? The, and I'm not sure about what your laws are in your state, but in Oklahoma, the uh, what we have to do is if there's a concern that um, the child has been sexually abused, um, and it's not we wouldn't be concerned about that just because the child has had a sexual behavior problem. But if during our interview with either the parent or the child, um, they indicate some type of child maltreatment, either physical abuse or neglect um, or sexual abuse, we would make a report. But in regards to child um, on child sexual behavior, um, our child welfare and our legal um, here has advised us to make a report only if we feel that it's because the, uh, the parent has, um, has either failure to protect or has not intervened appropriately. Um, that is, that those are our guidelines for the state on when do we make a report. If someone else knows their guidelines um, for your state, you can uh, put those on the chat and I can mention those. We have another question. Uh, most children with sexual behavior problems can be treated on an outpatient basis. True, false, or I don't know. We're still gathering results. I think we're done. Um, most of you got that right. Uh, most children with sexual behavior problems can be treated on an outpatient basis. Um, I do want to talk, there is a few, very few small select percentage that need to be in residential or inpatient um, placements. Um, maybe they have severe co-occurring disorders. Maybe they, whatever you try, supervision and intervention isn't working. But you want to reserve those placements for the most severe cases. Um, several reasons. One is the cost to your state and to the taxpayers. Um, it's definitely much more costly to have residential placement. And two, if you really, really have a severe um, case that you need a placement for and they're not available because they're being used by kids who could have been treated in the outpatient um, environment, then, it's con then you may have to send your kid um, to an, uh, another state, which makes it even harder to have parent involvement. Um, just briefly to talk about, because we're kind of running short, on, well, not short on time, but we, def we want to leave room for questions, is when you're talking about residential placement, it does give you a controlled environment. It gives you daily and extensive um, treatment contact, much higher levels of community protection, and their safety for the child. Um, but there are some concerns with that. I mean, all that sounds good, and, you're, and some people are like, sign me up for that. But there are definitely some concerns, um, particularly if the placement, the inpatient placement, is a long way away. There's difficulties in obtaining parent and caregiver involvement, and all these kids need to have caregiver involvement and treatment. There's also exposure to other children with even more severe behavior problems and more severe um, sexual behavior problems. There's a disruption in their social attachments and normal activities. And remember, you want these kids involved in pro-social activities and normal activities. You want them to develop normally. There's a labeling and stigma that goes along with them. Oftentimes, um, people, uh, inpatient treatment facilities, and this comes from the kids we treat, um, if they come from an inpatient facility, they're often told they're perpetrators and they'll always be perpetrators, and you don't want the kids thinking that. And again, there's a very high cost for these kind of facilities. So um, it is really important when you consider this to reserve these for the most um, severe cases. Um, when you're talking about placement decisions, there may be, um, we talked briefly about, there may be short-term placement disruption, so maybe the kid can be placed with a relative or a friend 
for a few weeks until they get into treatment and the parents learn about proper supervision, or they may can stay in the same home, but you need to look at um, the effects of the other child. Are the parent, can the parents supervise and are they supportive of everybody? And what other problems are going on in the home? We had a case one time where a family was homeless and they lived in a van. And it was, you know, that's really a hard place. There's lots of supervision going on, but there's a lot of other problems. And so what needed to happen to support that family? Um, look at supervision at the home and school, response to supervision. And again, most children can be, I cannot say this enough, most children with sexual behavior problems can successfully be successfully treated in the home and go to school and participate in normal activities. Now I'm going to talk a little bit about what to look for um, in terms of treatment for um, a child with sexual behavior problems. Um, it is crucial um, to have caregivers involved in the treatment. Um, you, you know, just seeing a child individually, you really have limited ability to change that child's behavior, whether it's sexual behavior problems or general behavior problems, without directly involving the adult. Um, in the child's life, the main caregiver in the child's life, to be able to work at home to change that child's behavior. Um, so you absolutely have to have um, a therapist who will work with the family um, and, most importantly, the caregivers um, in adjusting the child's sexual behavior. Um, if the sexual behavior problem occurred in the home or with another child family member, um, it may also be important to have the family involved in treatment as well. So maybe the younger siblings, um, depending on the age and other factors, you may want to involve that child as well in treatment. Um, a few years ago, our um, colleagues here, uh, Dr. Selevsky, Bard, and St. Amon, um, who uh, was from Canada and came here for um, to, to complete her dissertation, um, did a study where they um, looked at all of the known treatments um, for children with sexual behavior problems. And uh, I'll just talk about this briefly, but what they did was pulled out all of the components that were alike um, in the treatment and determined what was the most what, what were the most effective components in treating a child with sexual behavior problems? And what they found was that caregiver involvement was critical. You had to have the caregiver involved in order to make a change in the child's behavior. Um, the individual treatment of a child without involving caregivers just was not effective. Um, and that the effective treatment included teaching um, parents behavior management skills and parenting skills. Um, so uh, behavioral parent training, for example, was involved in the effective uh, treatments. Um, another thing that was effective was, um, or should be included in a treatment, uh, would be teaching them rules about sexual behavior. So teaching the child and teaching the caregiver what are good rules about sexual behavior, and we have some of those to show you in a minute. Uh, the other thing that was important was um, involving the parents and the child in teaching the children developmentally appropriate sex education. Um, that appeared to be important for two reasons. One, it t taught the children what was appropriate um, and what, you know, kind of was expected in terms of sexual behavior, but it also opened up the communication with parents and children so that if the child had a question in the future, they had somebody that they could go and talk to about those things. Um, the other important piece was teaching abuse prevention skills. Um, so spending some sessions and time working with the caregiver and ch children about um, preventing abuse. Um, and they did find um, techniques that were found to not be effective in the treatment of children. Um, and, and these are typically techniques that were used um, from adult sex offender treatment or adolescent sex offender treatment and those were teaching them the cycles of abuse. Um, so like teaching them their cycle, uh, and again, this is typical in adult treatment, but since children really don't have that cycle, that same thinking pattern that adults have, it was not effective at all in treating their sexual behavior problems. Um, the other one that was found not to be uh, effective was arousal reconditioning. Again, this is something that's used with um, adults that children are, are different, and so this, again, was not effective with, with children. Um, 
I'll just talk a little bit about kind of the two most common methods of treatment um, for children with sexual behavior problem. Uh, one is family therapy and one is group therapy. Uh, and usually group therapy is uh, the most common format that we have here in Oklahoma. We have um, a metropolitan uh, area where we're able to have enough children um, who have sexual behavior problems and that can come to group. Um, and there are several advantages to that. One, it allows the children and the caregivers to practice their skills um, among their peers. Um, and so um, it gives them kind of a natural environment, especially for kids that are having social problems, to be able to practice those skills with other kids. Um, and it gives accountability to the group. So if there's a sexual behavior rule broken or a lapse in supervision, the parent or the child has to come back um, and be accountable to the group um, and talk about what they did and what they would do differently to, um, to make sure rules weren't broken in the, in the future. Um, another crucial aspect of this is support for parents. Like Carrie mentioned earlier, having a child with sexual behavior problems um, is very isolating. It's not something that you can elicit support from other people or feel comfortable talking about with other people. Um, so this gives a good environment for them to get some support. Um, it does require, since many of these kids um, have uh, uh, behavior problems, it requires a lot of structure and a so that you're able to manage the group. Um, and make sure that the behavior problems are under control and are addressed quickly. Um, and so we would recommend that if there is going to be a group therapy approach with children, that there be at least two therapists uh, in that group managing the children's behavior. Um, family therapy is also um, another perfectly acceptable way to treat children with sexual behavior problems. Um, and the advantages of that is you're able to address other concurrent issues that are going on um, with a child with the family. Um, if there's crisis, um, you're able to deal with those. Um, if the parent is having one of those really strong negative reactions um, to the child, um, you can certainly deal with that a lot better um, and easier in family therapy than you could in group therapy. And for rural areas, it just may not be um, feasible to have a group of children with sexual behavior problems. Okay, there's some questions that just came up that we'll answer in just a minute. Um, this is um, what we recommend in terms of supervision um, for children with sexual behavior problems. So when we have a family come in for um, assessment and then later for treatment, um, we will give them um, a list of supervision require or recommendations. Um, and so that's what we'll ask Logan uh, to forward to you uh, through email um, is this list that you can use to give out to parents. Um, but what we recommend is that there be close supervision. So that means uh, when the child is going to be with other children, that an adult be there um, to hear and see what is going on. Um, so, you know, no letting them play in the other room while you're making dinner. If you're making dinner, then all the kids are in the kitchen um, with you or helping you so that you can see and hear what's going on. Um, it's recommended that the child bathe alone um, and sleep alone. Um, certainly there are times, you know, based on the configuration in the house that it may not be possible for them to have their own bedroom. Um, and if that's the case, we'll work with the caregiver on some other um, alternatives um, to the child sleeping alone, such as implementing the use of baby monitors or video monitors so that you can see what's going on um, at night, um, putting maybe the child in with a less in a room with a less vulnerable child, um, so an older teenager or something like that, um, if that's safe. Uh, we would recommend that there be no exposure to sexual material. If there are sexual materials in the house that the parents, we encourage them to remove those. Um, or if they cannot remove them, to lock them and hide the key because typically kids can find um, those kinds of things. That we're asking that all um, adults as well as all family members in the house maintain a privacy, maintain uh, privacy and boundaries so that, you know, when a family member has to change clothes, that that's done alone and behind closed doors, um, that there be a rule about knocking before you enter the bedroom, um, that adults are using appropriate modesty um, in the home in regards to um, their bathing habits or sexual habits so that, you know, hugging and kissing type things are fine, but if they're engaging in sexual activity, that that be done um, behind closed and locked doors. 
Um, and I mentioned this earlier that all members of the family should be included in this so that the child with sexual behavior problems aren't singled out, but that's just that these are going to be new rules in the family and we're all going to follow these rules to keep everybody safe. I mentioned earlier that we have some sexual behavior rules that we teach our school-age children. Um, on that uh, supervision handout that I'm going to ask Logan to forward to you all, it will have sexual behavior rules as well as private part rules. So the sexual behavior rules are what we teach our school-age children. The private part rules are um, modified um, sexual behavior rules, and they're used for preschool children. So they're shorter, they're easier to learn. Um, so these are pretty self-explanatory, um, and they can be modified um, for the situation. Uh, so you can use these and teach these to the caregivers um, that, that may call in or that you may be working with. And then we just wanted to take um, a minute to talk a little bit about how you would handle maybe certain situations. Um, so maybe you get a call that a mom has discovered her seven-year-old daughter in the closet um, with a cousin who's of the same age and their clothes are off. Um, we should have probably asked a question here, but so that, you know, based on what we were talking about earlier, if this was the first incidence of that behavior, that would certainly be something that would be in the range of typical sexual behavior. Um, and so you would advise them um, to, to, to separate the children, get their clothes on, and then bring the kids together maybe and talk about, you know, when we're playing with each other, we keep our clothes on, um, and then maybe separate them and see if they had any questions about that and then answer their questions um, as appropriate. Now, how would that change if, say, it was a 10-year-old with their 5-year-old cousin um, in the closet with clothes off? we could talk, I'm sure that most of you would say that that would be um, considered more problematic sexual behavior given the difference in the age level of the kids. Um, and so that may be something that you'd want to talk, you'd certainly want to separate them, have them get dressed, and then talk to the children individually about what happened, what led up to that, um, and then talk about what are some sexual behavior rules. Um, certainly let the five-year-old parent know what was going on, um, but I would recommend an assessment for treatment for the 10-year-old child involved in that behavior. Mm -hmm. um, if a child, you know, I was going to just go to the next example. If a child engages in sexually inappropriate talk with their siblings and there's giggling going on and the siblings are about the same age, um, you know, those probably, again, in the realm of, Sexual, typical sexual behavior, you would want to separate them, or you would actually just want to talk to them about if this is not okay, it's not okay to make others uncomfortable, if you have questions, who can you go to to talk to, um, talk to them about their questions. If the siblings are a significantly different age or developmental level, then you may want to be a little more concerned. Um, you may not need to go to an assessment for treatment unless it happens again, but it's definitely something you would want to talk to the older sibling or more developed sibling about. This is inappropriate with your younger sibling. This can't happen again. If you want to talk about these things, here's people you can talk about. If your sibling comes to you wanting to talk about these things, what do you need to do? Um, you know, redirect them to a parent, tell them it's not okay to talk with them about this sort of thing, et cetera. And then finally, the last one, a child masturbates in the living room while the family is watching TV. Um, so this could certainly be handled in several different ways. Um, let's say that the child is five years old, um, and so this is the first time or maybe even the second time that it's happened. That's probably within their range of typical sexual behavior, so that child needs to be taught some rules about um, what would be okay um, to do in the presence of others and then redirecting that child that if they want to touch themselves, they need to go do that in private or another alternative might be, let's, we're not gonna do this in the living room and find something else to do with your hands. So you might give the child something to color or something like that. So giving them another activity to do with their hands um, so they can't touch themselves while they're watching TV. If say this was um, a child that continued to do this despite all those effective uh, parenting interventions and the child still didn't understand the rules and continue to do this, again, I would refer that child um, for an assessment to determine if treatment is needed. 
I want to get to a couple of questions that we had, and then we'll open it up for some other questions. Um, let's see. Uh, somebody asked, what is arousal reconditioning? Um, that is a series of techniques that can be used, again, with adult uh, sex offenders where you would show them uh, pictures um, or images um, that would typically arouse them um, and then recondition them in a way so that they're not aroused to those images anymore. So you'd use something like a noxious stimuli like a smell or a bad thought in their head, putting a bad thought in their head to try to get them reconditioned um, out of those inappropriate fantasies or thoughts and then um, getting them reconditioned by using positive things with more appropriate images or appropriate uh, fantasies and in reinforcing the appropriate ones. Um, someone uh, reported in or uh, made a comment about Washington state law does not specify what to do about um, whether or not children with sexual behavior problems needs to be reported. Um, it, uh, it only gives us this guideline for mandatory reporters, which says abuse or neglect means sexual abuse, sexual exploitation, or injury of a child by any person under circumstances which cause harm to the child's health, welfare, or safety. So I guess those are some guidelines that you can use to determine reporting. Um, we have a question about where can the advocates look in their community for professionals to assess for sexual behavior problems? Um, you, I, you know, it's always best to use your local resources. Anybody that you know that provides um, really good treatment or that you trust or others in the community that you know refer kids to treatment providers that they trust, those are, I think, always the best referrals. But if you don't know anybody in the area or um, there are two organizations that you can refer to, um, one is ATSA.com. It's the Association for the Treatment of Sexual Abusers. They actually have a um, website, and it's ATSA.com, and they have a, it's an online form, and they will fax you. It's only for members of ATSA, but they um, it's an online form, and I can't remember the buttons, but um, it says for treatment provider referrals, and then you put in the information you want, and they will send you back a list of providers that are members to that organization, um, and you can call those um, providers um, and ask them things about do they involve the family, et cetera, things we've talked about. The other organization, and I don't can't remember their website, um, but it's Safer Society, Inc., and if you just Google Safer Society, it pulls it up. And it's about halfway down the middle of the page. Or no, at the top it says uh, References. And you click on that. And then halfway down that page it says Click Here for Recommendations. And again, you can fill out an online form and they can fax it to you or email it to you or mail it to you. And they have a list of treatment providers um, in, in an area that you can go to. Um, and so I would um, recommend either one of those places for treatment provider recommendations or anybody in your area that you trust that primarily does treatment. And you do want to look for somebody who's familiar with child development and used to working with children and um, they're not afraid to use the word sex and talk about development with kids. And, and there's other aspects too that we talked about earlier in terms of are they going to involve the caregiver? Um, and will they include those other components of treatments that have found to be effective? And then I, just this last slide is that ATSA task force um, convened several years ago and uh, made a task force report on children with sexual behavior problems, which has lots of good information about treatment um, of children as well as public policy for children um, and appropriate assessment of children um, with sexual behavior problems. And that can be downloaded for free um, with this website. Were there any other, oh, here's another question. Oh, okay, there's, question. There's, there's some questions coming up. Um, so, yeah, um, one question is, what is your opinion on parents giving consequences to kids when they sexually misbehave after the kids have been taught the rules around sexual behaviors, touching, et cetera, in the same fashion as they would give consequences for other misbehaviors? Um, certainly, if they are continuing to engage in sexual behavior after they've been taught rules 
um, about touching, et cetera, um, I would recommend a, an assessment to see if they should uh, be a, uh, appropriate for treatment, if they are appropriate for treatment. Um, but when we have kids who are in treatment and who engage in problematic sexual behavior, there, we talk with the parents about what are appropriate consequences. Um, and so we try to make them fit, um, say, the situation or um, make it logically fit the situation. So for example, if they had a friend come over um, and they said something sexually inappropriate to the friend, um, a good consequence would be that they're not allowed to have a friend over for a while until they've um, shown us that they you know, know what the sexual behavior rules are and can keep those rules for a period of time. Um, for younger children, you might do something like a brief time out um, for the sexual behavior. Um, for older kids, um, we've run into this um, more frequently lately where they um, are using their cell phones to um, either look up inappropriate content on the internet or send inappropriate text messages. And so an appropriate consequence for that is that they don't have access to their cell phone or their internet for a period of time. So I certainly think consequences are appropriate um, once they've been taught rules. Um, and then there's a, a comment here, Vermont law defines child sex abuse as any act or acts by any person involving sexual molestation or exploitation of a child, including but not limited to incest, prostitution, rape, sodomy, or any lewd and lascivious conduct involving a child. Um, I think that's in response to other guidelines in terms of reporting um, laws for your state. So thank you for sending that. Any other questions? Well, I think we um, will go ahead and wrap up for today. But um, thank you both so much for being here with us and sharing such wonderful information and resources. Um, I will definitely make sure that all of our participants um, receive that additional handout as well as the slides from today. So. Okay, and we will email you that handout. Okay. Great. Okay. Great. Thank you all so much for being here. Thank Take you. Care. Thank you. Please stand by.